Welcome to the 2021 Watershed Congress. This is Thursday, day four of our virtual Watershed Congress week, and we are happy that you're joining us today. The Watershed Congress is organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with many other organizations. My name is Autumn, and I am the Development Associate for the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. I am also your moderator for this session, Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin. Where have we come from and where are we going? We are pleased to present David Bressler, our speaker for this session. Part of the Stroud Water Research Center, David facilitates and supports citizen science efforts focused primarily on the Delaware River Basin. David has been traveling and sent us a pre-recorded presentation to avoid connectivity issues. However, he is joining us live to answer your questions. So with that, you wanna go ahead and start the presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm David Bressler. I'm with the Stroud Water Research Center. Uh, I'm going to be talking with you today about Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin. It's a program that the Stroud Center has been supporting for the last several years with uh, watershed groups and schools and universities across the Delaware Basin, supported by the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. Uh, these are the stations we've been deploying. It's an Enviro DIY program. All the data go to monitor my watershed data portal where you can display graphs and look at the sites on the map. And I'm gonna talk about all kinds of support that we've been developing and how folks can get involved if they'd like. So let's get right into it here. So the main point today, Stroud Center is supporting Enviro DIY in the, in the Delaware River Basin. So I'm gonna talk about how this has been happening, who's involved currently, what's being learned, what's been happening, and how others can get involved. More specifically, I'm gonna talk about Enviro DIY, kind of give an overview of what that is, um, talk about Monitor My Watershed, then the data portal, and then I'm gonna get into the specifics uh, for Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin. I'm going to talk about past, present, and future. I'm going to, in that context, I'm going to be talking history a little bit about where we came from. I'm going to talk about case, show some case studies that kind of demonstrate how the data are being used, what's happening out there. And I'm also going to talk about resources um, that are available to support folks in building, managing stations, using the data, applying the data. And um, and then how people can get involved. What are the roles that different people and groups play with regard to these stations? Okay, so Enviro DIY, what is it? It is a community for do-it-yourself environmental science and monitoring. It's a part of the Wiki Watershed Toolkit, which is a toolkit of all kinds of resources to help basically anyone that wants to work at the watershed realm and better understanding their watershed. EnviroDIY.org. Here's the front page of the website. You can see there's a lot of different options here. General description about the site, how to participate, a uh, little bit about the Mayfly Data Logger, which is the centerpiece of EnviroDIY, uh, a blog where folks can post stories, a forum where people can get question and answer uh, feedback on any issues they have in building their own stations or managing their stations. There's videos available, video tutorials, and there's, a, and there's a shop where you can buy different um, uh, products, Mayfly boards, monitoring kits, et cetera. And then there's a help tab, okay? So as I mentioned, Enviro DIY is part of the <clears throat> Wiki Watershed Toolkit. You can see it's here, along with Model My Watershed, which I'm sure a lot of folks know about. Monitor goes hand in hand with Enviro DIY. It's the data portal. Um, the data are sent to from Enviro DIY. Leaf Pack is also sent to monitor my watershed. Macroinvertebrates.org, a taxonomy site for macroinvertebrates, and the Water Quality app. So, but I'm focusing on Enviro DIY today and monitor my watershed in the context of the Delaware River Basin. So, but a little more about the, the Mayfly data logger. Here it is. Um, so it, like I said, is kind of the brains of these um, stations and 
machines that are being put out all over. The idea with the Mayfly board is that it is customizable for any number of different sensors from different manufacturers. It's open source, it's totally open to the public. It's uh, Arduino software that it runs with, and it's entirely designed by Shannon Hicks, who's the Stroud Center engineer. So Enviro DIY, there's lots of possibilities. Um, the idea is to use this Mayfly board, which is customizable for different sensors. You can talk to different sensors using the Mayfly board. So you can set up all kinds of different sensors out there and collect data. These are just a couple different setups that have been put out there in the streams. And these are titles from blogs that people posted on EnviroDIY.org describing their own EnviroDIY contraptions that they've built. Um, <clears throat> so EnviroDIY is global at this point. However, you can see this is the front page of the map that you get into and monitor my watershed. You can see that most of the stations are in North America and most are really in the Eastern half of the US. And even going beyond that, more specifically, the highest density of stations are in the Delaware River Basin. And that is due to this uh, project that I am describing today. So um, lots of different ways to build stations with the Mayfly data logger, but uh, what Stroud Center has been deploying uh, in collaboration with groups across the Delaware Basin is this standard station. You can see it here. I've gotten more pictures to describe this, but um, you can see this is the, the logger and the solar panel on, on shore. This is the logger box when it's open. You can see the Mayfly data logger there, battery, and wires connecting to the sensors. This is a cell module sends data to the portal. And then you have the sensors in stream. You can see they're on a PVC pole, which is on top of a rebar that's driven into the stream bottom, connected with this pin that allows the sensors to stay at a consistent depth. So you can remove them and put them back at exactly the same depth. Again, credit where credit is due, Shannon Hicks designed this, um, this station and it has been very resourceful and really, um, is the reason why this program has been successful, a major reason why it's been successful. So um, a little more about this standard station. You can see that the on land component here, logger box, solar panel in the bundle, you can see runs down wires that are tacked into the stream bank and then out into the water. The bundle is attached. You can see a little more inside the box. Battery connecting in wires running out to the solar panel. Here's the cell board with its antenna tucked back in here to protect it. And then you can see wires coming out here, running down and coming out the bottom, going into the stream. Here's a little uh, <clears throat> more detailed image of the uh, Mayfly data logger. Lots of components here, just some basic ones, power switch, SD card slot. We have an adapter to put in here for an upright, upright SD card slot that allows it to be removed more easily. Here's your uh, points for connecting battery and solar panel. And then here's your points for, <clears throat> excuse me, for connecting the sensors. Okay, um, little close up view here of the cell board. So you can see this cell board um, is transmitting via 4G LTE uh, cell signal. We had a lot of these stations out originally with 2G. We have um, upgraded most of the stations to 4G as the 2G has, has been phased out. Um, here's some more images of the sensor bundle underwater. You can see the sensors are attached with a hose clamp, uh, zip ties to fix the wires in place. You can see hose clamp uh, tighten back here. And you can see here this clip. Uh, this PVC onto which these sensors are attached slides down on top of this black rebar, which is driven into the stream bottom. And then you have holes in that rebar that allow you to fit that pin in so that, this, so that the sensors can go back at the same depth. That's mostly important with regard to the depth measurements coming off of this uh, CTD sensor, conductivity temperature depth. Um, 
And here are those sensors. So here's the CTD sensor, conductivity, temperature, and depth. Depth is measured uh, via this ceramic pressure transducer, which is very sensitive. You have to be careful not to damage that. Mm -hmm. Conductivity is measured on these screw heads, uh, which can foul. They get covered in algae and sediment. You need to keep those clean by brushing them with long, soft bristles of your brush. And this is the close-up of the turbidity sensor, sort of the, the turbidity eyeball that shoots out into the water to measure uh, the turbidity of water, the cloudiness of the water. As you can see, um, this um, is just, there's, there's no wiper here. There's nothing to protect it from fouling. So it's pretty important to keep this uh, sensor, sensor clean and it can foul fairly easily. These, these stations do take maintenance and upkeep and I'll get into that more. Okay, so um, one last thing about the standard station SD card slot, I mentioned the upright slot. Um, SD card data are where the most secure data are generally stored. If you lose cell connectivity, data will still be registering on the SD card and can then be uploaded later to the Monitor My Watershed data portal. Um, <clears throat> so the data are being collected every five minutes. So you can see here, every five minutes a data point is coming in. And for all these different parameters, you see conductivity, temperature, depth, temperature of the mayfly board, battery, et cetera. So then, as I mentioned, data are transmitted from the station via cell signal to the Monitor My Watershed data portal, where you see all the stations that are out there on a map, color-coded map, and you can access the real-time data, as well as 72-hour plots. And then you can take and look at all the data via the time series analyst, showing all of the historical data for multiple parameters or multiple sites. So I'm gonna get into a little more about Monitor My Watershed and those functions that I just uh, touched on. So um, this, is the, this is the cover page when you come into Monitor My Watershed, monitormywatershed.org. Um, you're generally gonna to wanna to click on Browse Sites, which takes you to this map which is a color-coded map showing you how recently data have been received at a site. So dark green is the freshest. Those are live stations, and then it just kind of goes down from there. And then if you click on one of these sites, you get a pop-up like this, which gives you some basic information, site name, or site code, site name, lat long, et cetera. And then if you click on this tab right here, it takes you into the home page of that site, which has a map of the site that you can scroll on, change from satellite to map, gives you the info about the site, station owner, when it was deployed, so on and so forth. And you also will then access all of these data panels or sparkline plots. Um, they show 72 hours worth of data. This uh, data point here is the most recent that has been received. And um, going a little closer on these panels, as I mentioned, this is the most recent data. You can see here a specific time and the, the associated number. Um, these panels are really nice also because you can view them very easily on your smartphone. So if you're out in the field and you wanna look at the real-time data, which you really need to be doing when you're cleaning sensors and you're doing quality control so you can understand how your work is influencing the data, you can access these spark lines on your phone. Um, and then <clears throat> going beyond the spark lines, you can then access the time series analyst in which you can plot multiple variables on one another. Here we have conductivity, temperature, and depth shown here. You can see these uh, patterns. Depth goes up, conductivity goes down and dilutes. You can see day and night patterns and temperature, etc. Um, and in the time series analyst, you also have the option of, <clears throat> well, say you can zoom in on all the axes with your mouse, X and Y axes. You can also define ranges of data that you want to look at initially. So you can look at a week, a month, or all the data, or you can do custom ranges. And then you have the <clears throat> legend here that describes the parameters that you have in there. You can do multiple parameters or you can do multiple sites. So you can do one parameter and uh, multiple sites for that parameter, comparing across sites. 
And then whatever uh, parameter is highlighted here, for here in blue, that is the um, summary statistics that you get um, here below it, which are also displayed in Laundry My Watershed. So you can click back and forth between these to get the summary statistics. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to just an overview of the basic, very basic types of ecology concepts that we work with and that we see in Monitor My Watershed. So here we're looking at temperature. You can see seasonal patterns here, winter, summer, winter, summer. It's a good data series. So you can see uh, multiple years of data there. And then you, the jiggity jaggedness, you can see is the day to, day to night variations. Here when we zoom in, you can see day night variations and you can see how that varies. And you can imagine how summarizing that, comparing that to reference ranges, comparing that to criteria, trout criteria, for instance, could be very useful. Another pattern we described that we, we see that I described earlier, that I alluded to earlier, is this pattern of uh, water depth and conductivity. So there's a baseline conductivity at each stream that is influenced by natural conditions as well as anthropogenic conditions, human uh, contributions such as road salt can uh, increase conductivity a lot. But one of the patterns we see a lot is water comes in from runoff during storms and that runoff is usually very dilute, doesn't have a lot of ions. It's coming out of the sky and it doesn't have a lot of ions in it. So it causes the stream water to become diluted. So you see that conductivity go way down during bigger storms. And you see it go less, go down less in smaller storms. Um, this is an urban stream that this, is, that this data is for. And those urban streams have very flashy high flows that come off quickly off the surface. surface. So you'll often see extreme dilution in those cases. And here you can see that this dilution in this more major storm almost went down to zero conductivity. Another pattern we see with conductivity is spikes. In the winter time, for instance, is often when we see spikes due to road salt. So you have small uh, snow melt, ice melt events, or rain flushing ice and, and snow and associated road salt into the streams causes a little bit of a rise in depth and major rises in conductivity. So you see these spikes as we call them happening uh, in response to road salts and de-icers being flushed into the streams and causing conditions that are no doubt um, not good for uh, creatures living in the stream or for drinking water. Again, this was a uh, urban stream located near Philadelphia. Other uh, concepts, um, unknown conductivity rises. Here we see um, a stream that is in a heavily forested watershed, and we see a rise in conductivity that is really unexplained. There's no rise in depth, and it's hard to tell without going out there at times what this is even due to. Is this real? Is it fouling, or is it a sensor malfunction? And oftentimes, you need to just go out to the stream and start seeing what's going on and checking with handheld meters to confirm the data you're seeing online are real. Um, another common pattern we see is with turbidity. As depth goes up, turbidity goes up. So as we see in a lot of streams, when storms happen, it flushes sediment into the stream and the water gets cloudy, the water gets muddy. And we see that with these uh, turbidity sensors. Nice correlations here, we're at 90. We see, we search, see turbidity going up to 300 or more. Um, but these sensors foul. So you're often diagnosing, what is it fouling or is it um, natural? Okay, um, so getting into the main gist of the conversation of the presentation here today, our overview of the Enviro, Enviro DIY program in the Delaware River Basin. So I'm gonna talk about the past, the present and the future. History for context, talking about resources for users, for folks that might wanna get involved. Um, I'm gonna go through some case studies and, um, and then I'm gonna get into options, how people can get, get involved in the roles and responsibilities that they can play. Okay, so our overall vision for this whole program, past, present, and moving into the future, is to simply make it increasingly easier for people to monitor water using EnviroDIY. And that means 
gone beyond that as well, I should say going beyond that as well. The goals are to understand, analyze, apply data for management education and outreach, support people in being able to more easily do those things, apply the data, understand the data, use the data. Um, <clears throat> one thing to point out here, this uh, Delaware River Basin work is a, you know, it's a new project, so it's a pilot of sorts. And um, other groups such as Trout Unlimited are starting to use this. So it's, um, you know, anyone who's involved here can, I think, really can feel like they're really, they're involved in, in building something that uh, hopefully will be more and more accessible to more and more people in this country and more broadly. Um, so uh, uh, going down a little more in detail with regard to Stroud's perspective on things in the Delaware River Basin, our primary goal with these stations is to simply support station owners, managers, and volunteers in using the stations for their own purposes. So Stroud Center does not own the majority of these stations. They're owned by groups that are out just using the stations for their own purposes. And our goal at the Stroud Center is to do our best to support users in doing what they wanna do with their stations and help them to also to understand what they can, can do with their stations. Secondary goal is to build resources to help doing that. So analyzing the data, basin-wide data set but then also developing tools that can be used to better characterize, more easily characterize and, and put these watersheds in a, in a context that relates to the continuous data that are coming off of these stations. So this uh, effort is supported by the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. Feel free to check out this website. It's a William Penn Foundation funded project. We also have, have been able to support groups in Pennsylvania via the Consortium for Scientific Assistance to Watersheds. Um, so who is the we that we're talking about here? I mentioned groups, schools, and universities along working with the Stroud Center, um, <clears throat> all supported via the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, but here's, um, here's all the groups that are involved, or most of them at least, and here's the list. Okay, so you can see a, a lot of different um, watershed groups in there, schools and universities, Westchester University, Wallkill Watershed Management Group, bigger groups like Trout Unlimited and Nature Conservancy. And then there's some high schools like Montgomery School, the Independent School, um, Conestoga School. Um, and so folks are, are continuing to to add on to this list. So the list is growing um, and there's gonna be a continuous need for support from the Stroud Center, but also for intergroup support, which we, we've been having a lot more success with lately. So a little bit about where we came from in terms of technology. How is it that the Stroud Center was able to provide this resource? Um, Stroud Center has these, um, these machines available for public use. That wasn't always the case. Um, Shannon Hicks, has been, who's the engineer at the Stroud Center, has been developing this technology for over 20 years. This is just some of the miscellaneous um, uh, contraptions that she has developed for monitoring different things. Um, here's a series of different Mayfly data loggers that have been designed back years ago, adding on additional boards to help with functionality. But getting better and better with that, where these boards are then um, incorporated into a single Mayfly board. And Shannon is coming out with an upgrade to the newest board here soon as well. Um, so Shannon was doing this for a lot of years and in you know about this time, 2016 or so, um, it was fortunately that the standard station was pretty much ready and was functional and reliable enough that it was able to go public. Um, for us to grant to groups and also to be for sale on places like Amazon. So Shannon's you seeing orders like this so that they can be put up on, on Amazon. EnviroDIY.org, Anthony Offenkamp, who's now with Limnitech and plays a major role in support of the infrastructure for this. Um, and Shannon Hicks developed EnviroDIY.org. Um, GitHub is an important component of that where you can access all of the programs, uh, all the coding to, um, 
code the Mayfly to interact with a number of different sensors. Um, <clears throat> we started in this program with this Dream Hosters data portal. It was kind of a holding place until Monitor My Watershed could be developed. Um, Monitor has been developing for the last several years and will be upgraded in the future. There's some fairly major plans to upgrade it. I'll get into some of those in a bit as well. Um, going through just some basics of these um, general timelines we've been on over the years. Um, 2017 to 2018, Stroud gr granted about 60 Enviro DIY monitoring stations. Uh, to groups across the Delaware River Basin. This is a one-year contract that groups have just pretty much kept up with it, and Stroud has been able to support their using the stations. We started developing resources. Um, I mentioned the, the Dream Hosters portal, and we started developing uh, classes. There's the Dream Hosters portal. Um, we did a number of different types of workshops, field classes, demonstrations, uh, classes with some high schools, and we installed a lot of stations. So we were installing all these stations throughout that process. And one thing to point out, we were all learning during that, and that still continues. A lot going on, and there's a lot of adjustments over time. Um, doing on-site tutorials, on-site trainings, all sort of in this time frame, building all, that, um, all those resources out. And in 2018-19, really buckling down on developing data sheets and um, doing a lot more trainings, building out this manual, um, building out quick guides that kind of get right to the point of how you maintain stations, how you do quality control, building out a lot of different tutorials, how to clean the sensors, how to install stations, how to do quality control, a um, comprehensive data sheet that can be entered online so that all the data are accounted for, all of your site visit data are accounted for. You can add cleaning information on this. You can add quality control information on this and continuing with on-site support, which can often be one-on-one -on -one trainings and such. All of this information is located in this page here, which I'll refer to multiple times throughout here today. Uh, and then getting to 2019 to 2021, um, we introduced this building workshop where we walk folks through building a station from scratch, built the manual out even more and built tutorials out to uh, guide on installing stations and other more complicated processes. Um, <clears throat> along with that station building process, we're um, more recently built this have this monitoring kit available that folks can purchase that includes everything uh, other than the sensor to build a station. Um, again, building out the manual and building more tutorials and then building out Monitor My Watershed, increasingly upgrading that to be more and more functional. And of course, Stroud Center technical support throughout the process, introducing items like this service request form, standardized way for groups to reach out to Stroud for um, for service of their stations, and then producing guidance documents like this, which lays out recommended roles and responsibilities uh, for groups. So um, where are we now? All of these materials, this is a little bit of a rehash. So we have data sheets, we have a manual, we have all kinds of different videos here, linked in through YouTube, continuing to do uh, workshops and trainings, we have this online list of uh, different resources. I encourage you to check that out. If I have time, I'll go into this directly and do some of the pull down menus. Um, <clears throat> we have an online group and we have ongoing assistance from Stroud technicians, Krista Reeves, uh, Shannon Hicks, Rachel Johnson. And we're having a lot of success, a lot more recently, we're having quite a bit of success with group to group support. So groups that are have built their capacity are going out and training other groups. And that certainly is a direction that we have hope to go in more in the future. So at present, we have over 100 stations deployed across the Delaware Basin by over 50 groups. Uh, these stations are about 10 kilometers or less watershed size. So that's a little bit different than, for instance, a lot of the USGS stations. So it gives us a pretty unique data pool. Here's the uh, timing of, or the amount of stations that were put out each year. So 
decreasing. This was simply because this time frame we were granting a lot of stations from here on out. It was a lot of groups just building stations. Stroud stopped building stations in this um, time frame and started supporting groups and building them. So a lot of data points have been collected, um, over 227 million data points at this, at this point in time have been collected. So every five minutes for all these parameters among 100 stations or more adds up quickly. Uh, quite a few groups have multiple stations out. You can see East Stroudsburg University with seven. I think they actually may even have a couple more than that with quite a few stations. Nature Conservancy, Trout Unlimited all have um, a number of stations out. So it is possible to be managing multiple stations. You just have to have the crews who can, who can do that, keep them functioning. Um, and that speaks to this, where uh, since 2018, there's been over 3,000 site visits made by groups and volunteers to the stations, cleaning sensors, doing quality control, uh, over 900 visits for quality control, cross-checking sensor data with calibrated handheld meters, and then over 350 troubleshooting uh, visits by Shannon and Rachel pretty much uh, by the Stroud Center in uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, <clears throat> so we're at 1256. So I will, I think, go through, skip through this. When you get some time, check this site out. It has a lot of really good resources. If you study this and you study the resources that are in it, you're pretty much guaranteed to really understand a lot of where we're at with this. It's complicated stuff. Um, it takes some time to, to understand all of the ins and outs, but once you get it, um, you can really start contributing to the network. Um, I encourage you to check out Monitor My Watershed and ViroDIO as, as well. There's a help tab in Monitor My Watershed where you can access um, a manual and video tutorials and a couple quick and a quick guide on how to use monitor my watershed. Um, okay, so getting into some more case studies type stuff. So here's just a quick list of different groups that are doing different things with the stations. Musconet Kong Watershed Association and New Jersey Trout Unlimited working in northern New Jersey. Um, number of different things looking at temperature and brook trout. They had some issues with a treatment plant trying to see about uh, effluent dilution. So they used some stations to answer those questions. In Delaware, Delaware Nature Conservancy was working with the First State National Historic Park and monitoring streams in that park. I mentioned Paul Wilson working uh, with the DRWI and working in his class in his classes at the university. Uh, the watershed hydrological analysis team doing some pretty heavy duty analysis regarding sediment loads. Um, <clears throat> the White Clay Wild and Scenic working uh, in Southeastern PA, uh, engaging with some municipalities. Um, these two groups, the Wallkill Watershed Management Group and the Lapat Concrete Initiative, worked with the Stroud Center in developing a watershed characterization, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and a number of others here, uh, Nature Conservancy of uh, New Jersey, Deer Park Rural Alliance in Southern New York, Broadhead Watershed Association, looking at some salt issues, Westchester University, I'll get into some more work that they've done along with Master Watershed Stewards and the Primrose Creek um, Watershed Association doing some really good work looking at uh, quarry discharges, monitoring depth of the stream in relation to quarry discharges. So to talk a little more about the first state national historic park situation that uh, the Nature Conservancy stream stewards are monitoring, six stations in the national park shown here, um, showing a number of pretty striking data patterns, um, salt spikes in the wintertime going even higher than is shown here, going over 50,000, but basically salt in the stream at times flowing with the uh, salinity of seawater, which had not really been known to be occurring in that region. Um, the stewards have also been kind of going upstream from the station to figure out where that salt is coming from. So baseline con conductivity conditions were also very high between seven and 900 base flow conductivity, which is well above the natural conditions of one to to 300. So they have been going upstream and sampling pipes 
at a lot of different stations. Here's the, here's the uh, monitoring station. Here's all their stations that they've been looking at with handheld meters and trying to figure out where the worst sources of um, these uh, conductivity influences are in this very urbanized and often channelized section of stream. And there's a red crayfish that I found one day just crawling right down the center of the concrete channel. You get out there to monitor these stations, you also just naturally start seeing things that are happening in the stream. So if nothing else, at least gets you out and gets you experiencing the stream. Uh, other conductivity spikes we see not happening with, um, with depth just randomly like uh, miscellaneous pollu pollution events. You can see these happening on a regular basis. Some master watershed stewards such as Carol Armstrong tried to get out there and time it uh, with handheld meters to uh, measure any uh, potential areas that might be polluting to try to figure this out. But unfortunately, these spikes went away before they were able to find the, the source. Here's those stations longitudinally on Cherry Creek uh, with East Stroudsburg University. This is generally showing a downward trend in um, or an upward trend in temperature, temperature going up, going downstream, but seeing some diversions from that where some of these lower stations are actually colder than the upstream stations. Why is that? Not quite sure, maybe due to limestone springs. Um, there's Paul, he's also using these stations in classroom engagement for undergrads and graduate students in clubs and classrooms and for research. Um, <clears throat> real data, you know, these students are working with. Uh, he kind of allows some students to do sort of some of these basic things like cleaning sensors, which take less expertise and then doing more expertise type things like building and installing stations and working with the data and then showing the data in uh, student forums. All for the purpose of simply getting students engaged with real data so that when they go out into the work world, they really understand in a way that a lot of other students may not. So. Um, Moving on to uh, the case study in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, Patty Haug with the Master Watershed Stewards, George Seeds with the Stewards, and Elizabeth Rushman with Conestoga High School have all worked on that. There's Patty and George doing their work. These five stations all centered in Westchester, basically trying to get an idea of what the water coming through Westchester looks like, out of and through Westchester looks like. Seeing strong patterns that weren't known before, such as these super high conductivity levels from the streams that are right in town. The streams that are in the grayest area of this satellite map with the most concrete have the highest conductivity. They're all well above what they should be though. And seeing different patterns. So some of these streams you can see during salt spikes in the wintertime, some of them having long extended periods of salt exposure to these to these organisms, uh, um, <clears throat> to, those, to those salt flushes, excuse me on my phone there. Um, others having real quick flushes. So this, these stations giving insights into exposure times and toxicity of organisms in these streams. Uh, longitudinal sampling was done by Elizabeth Rushman. Uh, it's kind of an independent study that she took on to do this past summer. She monitored a number of different sites going upstream of the station on the east branch of Plum Run, one of these stations in Westchester. And she found some interesting things. Um, all of the sites were exceeding conductivity um, thresholds. These are natural conductivity thresholds identified um, by some uh, researchers, recent researchers uh, who were um, talking about predicted and measured natural levels. So clearly all these sites exceeding natural levels and some of them exceeding uh, chloride drinking water and um, EPA chloride criteria. And then showing a clear pattern with relation to urban land use. So as the sites that are up here are having higher conductivity than the sites down here, which are getting more of it forested influence and getting dilution from less contaminated forested water. Um, watershed characterization that we did uh, along with Christine Rogers and Juniper Leifer 
um, with the two New Jersey groups. Uh, this was a kind of a template for potentially doing this type of watershed characterization work in a more standardized way in the future. Um, but we did certain things like comparing temperature, summertime temperature to New Jersey trout criteria. So you can see what this continuous data does. It allows you to see how on a daily basis water temperature compares to these different New Jersey trout uh, thresholds. And then we compared the same temperature data to natural sites in the same general vicinity. So you can see these forested sites having much lower temperatures than this non-forested impacted stream, the upper pollen kill. Did the same thing with conductivity. So this uh, conductivity was converted to chloride. And then we see long periods of conductivity in the summer and fall here on the upper pollen kill of when conductivity was well above recommended chloride criteria levels. Note, probably indicating there's stress on the organisms in that stream. And then doing the same thing with comparing to reference sites. So all these sites down here are heavily forested streams in the, in the region. And you can see that the conductivity of this upper pollen kill site well above these natural levels. So using these types of comparisons to characterize and understand watersheds according to the continuous data. So um, <clears throat> along those lines, what people are doing, how can others get involved? Here's the quick list, and I'm going to go through these in more detail. You can build a station. You can manage a station. You can use the data. Even if you don't own or manage a station, you can just go on to monitor my watershed and use the data. You can attend monthly meetings, workshops, and trainings. You just learn. Um, and you can support, you can support others and collaborate with other groups. So building and deploying a station, how can you do that? You can do it via an Enviro DIY build workshop. So um, these types of events are posted on Enviro DIY and on the Stroud Center website. The next workshop is, is uh, planned for early 22. So contact me if you'd like to be on an early access list. You can also build the station simply using the monitoring manual. It takes you through the whole process. And you can do it using the video tutorials. We have a two-day workshop, a complete um, beginning to end two-day workshop uh, recorded and um, shown here in um, Enviro DIY that, you can, that will walk you through the process. So you can use all of these together uh, or separate to build a station. Um, <clears throat> Equipment for building a station, we now have this monitoring kit, which is sold on the website. That contains everything except the sensor to build the station. So you build, buy the monitoring kit, you build the sensor, and you're ready to go with building a station. Um, ways to help beyond building a station, you can volunteer to help manage a station. You can manage the oversight, just making sure that these duties are taken care of. You can do desktop monitoring of the station. So basically monitoring monitor wa my watershed to make sure that the station is feeding data um, regularly, that it's live, make sure that the data look okay, make sure that there isn't data fouling, make sure that the power levels are okay. Uh, you can clean the sensors recommended once a week, or you can do quality control recommended on a quarterly basis. So I'll go through those here quickly. Um, so volunteering to help to manage a station, one of the things you can do is Monitor, monitor my watershed. So are the stations live? Oh, my station has turned yellow. What's going on? My station has turned light green. What's going on? Why isn't it dark green? Battery, battery is 4.0. Okay, great, it looks good. It's not down around 3.5, which is the cutoff for, for transmitting data to monitor my watershed. Turbidity, turbidity looks good. Um, turbidity fouls a lot though, so you'll often, Go in here and find turbidity of 1,000, which is a clear indication of fouling. So going in here, looking at these panels um, for whether the data look right. Um, <clears throat> cleaning sensors. Once a week is a recommended, but as needed. So you can go out and clean around the logger, not just the sensors. You get vegetation growing up around the logger box, clean, clean that off. Algae and sediment accumulating on the sensors, clean them up look nice and taking those long bristles and getting into that slot where those CTD uh, 
screw heads are located to make sure to get those clean. And doing quality control. So taking a calibrated handheld meter to cross check conductivity and temperature, make sure it lines up with what the monitor my watershed readings are. Taking a handheld ruler and measuring from the pressure transducer to the water surface to make sure that depth from the station is reading accurately. Um, another way folks can get involved is use the data and the resources, you know, for whatever reason. You, you can just go into Monitor My Watershed and use the data, even if you don't own a station or work with a station. So you can look at depth, looking at flooding risks. Montgomery School used the depth uh, chart to evaluate when their bridge would be covered in water um, to access the school. Um, as shown in the Westchester work, um, looking at freshwater salinization patterns. It's a huge problem across the world, freshwater salinization. Conductivity is a very easy measure of that. Easy to communicate with students and with the public. And incorporating more formally into classroom work. We do have lesson plans around Monitor My Watershed and are developing more. David Klein, one of the educators, is presenting on this at the Dive Deeper Summit um, today as well. Um, you can also just continue to learn about uh, what's going on in this effort. You can attend these monthly meetings every third Thursday of the month, 2.30 to 3.30. Uh, access that, those recordings of those on this uh, DRWI Wiki Watershed site. And there's plenty of workshops and trainings to attend. Um, and you can support others if you just want to get involved. Think about what groups may be wanting to get involved but can't because of money, or groups that want to get involved but can't because of personnel. We've had a lot of collaborations among groups to just make it happen in terms of putting these stations out, getting them built, and then having people available to manage them and do quality control, and to even just monitor the data and communicate with Stroud about problems. So um, additional support resources coming in the future. Um, Meetings, as I mentioned, our meetings uh, will continue. These monthly meetings that we do, if you'd like to be on that list, contact me. Director support, we're gonna continue with ongoing support for the stations. A lot of technology updates coming up. There's gonna be an updated Mayfly data logger, as I mentioned, uh, new cell boards designed by Shannon Hicks to be, be uh, more reliable than previous ones, new sensors coming from the um, companies along with supporting code on GitHub to program those sensors. And then uh, some ongoing Monitor My Watershed upgrades that should make the, the platform even more accessible and usable for, um, for, for, for anyone, hopefully. Um, equipment, the, monitor, the monitoring kits will continue to be sold. And Shannon's also going to be putting up uh, some new inventions up there that are going to make things even easier for um, uh, using these stations, making them more user friendly. Um, continuing with workshops, doing these build workshops. We had one on February of 2020. It's looking like we're going to have another one uh, early 2022. And continuing to do support workshops. Feel free to be in touch if you have ideas or groups of people that need support. We can, we can do custom workshops and stuff like that if there's a need expressed by, by uh, you know, groups collaborating. We're thinking about certifications um, so that people can get certified to manage high priority stations that may be uh, involved in um, you know, some higher level type research uh, endeavors. And then continuing to build out guidance materials. Again, I encourage you to go to this website to check out what's available. So longer term planning, just to emphasize here, Building out, we're, we're certainly thinking about developing ways to summarize the continuous data and really make using the data easier and more um, accessible so that folks can take the continuous data, summarize it, and have um, a clear idea of what that means for watershed health, for watershed integrity. And then hopefully even going beyond that, having uh, mechanisms developed where um, those summaries, those watershed characterizations can then be applied at the, at the watershed management level with decision makers um, and hopefully having a, having a clear pathway or template by which uh, those data and data summaries can then have 
um, clear mechanisms to uh, get into the decision-making environment. Building out monitor my watershed, I mentioned uh, working on uh, data correction options, quality control, including metadata, data sheets, photographs, et cetera. Again, key metrics being integrated directly into Monitor My Watershed, maybe even integrating rating curves to be able to transform depth to discharge conductivity of chloride, et cetera. Okay, lessons learned. Um, get familiar with the data logger and sensors. I'm just going through these lessons learned because they're just major points that we've kind of just come to over the years um, just to finish up here. So using Monitor My Watershed to track station function daily is important. You have to pay attention to what's happening with the station. If you don't pay attention, something could go wrong and you have bad data for weeks or months on end. So you have to pay attention to Monitor My Watershed, which means understanding how to use it. Cleaning sensors and doing quality control is the only way to ensure you're going to have good data. If your sensors are dirty, it's going to mean the data aren't good. If you aren't checking with quality control that your sensors are reading correctly, you have no idea whether the data are accurate. People, people, people are super important. You need reliable individuals to maintain these stations, to keep them functioning, to know what's happening on site with these stations on a regular basis so that you can keep them going. Um, <clears throat> communicating with Stroud is certainly helpful. Attending the meetings regularly so you stay in the loop uh, is going to be very helpful. Having backup funds is certainly useful uh, just to be able to replace different pieces of equipment that support your efforts. And then overall, just knowing what to do with the data is a big question. You know, you don't want to put a station out if you don't know how you're going to use the data. You want to have a pretty good idea of how you will use the data and what data levels will tell you about one thing, what data levels will tell you about another. If it exceeds this, what does it mean? If it doesn't reach this, what does it mean? That type of stuff. And Stroud is making efforts to try to support folks in doing that type of planning. Okay, um, just a quick note here on this product adoption curve. We're certainly in this phase of developing the technology and folks who are really kind of into this stuff are the main ones involved tools and resources are becoming more accessible. So we really are moving up this, um, you know, up this, up this curve. But um, certainly if this is interesting to you, if you feel like you're into technology, you're into this type of ecology monitoring, feel free to be in touch. Um, so contact me if you'd like to, whatever, be on the, the email list for the, for the monthly meetings, workshop updates, general updates, Etc. Be in touch with me. Um, feel free to be in touch. These are uh, the other folks involved. Carol Armstrong, George Seeds are key master watershed stewards in this project. So um, that is it. You folks can certainly feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any follow up questions. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, all the information provided will be on the YouTube because the presentation will be included. We also try to pass along any information that we are provided by our presenters so that you can follow up should you need more information. Um, but we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I wanted to thank David and everyone else once again for joining us and have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>